Thank you for listening to Crossroads Community Church. At Crossroads, our mission is to be the church by exalting the glory of God, sharing and showing the love of Christ, and inviting others to be recipients of Christ's love. Now here's this week's message. Um, and so far in this letter, Paul's really been communicating to Timothy the type of culture that should exist in the church today. Uh, not just in the church then, but also in the church in every city and every place, uh, wherever the people of God gather, because Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. Timothy was, one, a pastor, but he was also kind of like a bishop in a sense of overseeing all of the churches in that city. So the idea is that this stuff that Paul is communicating to him would get sent and replicated and presented to all of the congregations in that church. Uh, so, and now here's the thing, let me ask the question. Uh, culture varies from community to community. It doesn't matter what community you're in, everyone has a different type of culture. So I wanna give you a quick example, don't judge me. Um, how many people are familiar with country music? Anyone listen to country music? A lot of people, good. Okay, so within country music, there's a specific type of culture, right? So how many people have ever learned a line dance? Okay, very few of the country music people learn to line. Not a big deal, that's okay. How many people have ever um, ridden a mechanical bull? Okay, wow. Oh, I thought Karen's hand was up for a minute. She's just nodding her head. Okay, uh, now. Here's the thing. How many people have ridden a mechanical bull before and after going to the club at night? It's okay if you went to the club. Okay, yeah, uh, because it's part of the culture. It's part of the thing. Um, How many people have ever worn a cowboy hat to church or to the club? Okay, all right, yeah. Again, part of that culture. Don't see it too much out of that culture. Here's the thing. How many people have ever spent more than $100 on a pair of They're called blank kickers, but cowboy boots. Wow, okay, good for you guys, okay. I did not raise my hand that time because although I I, I have been line danced, right? Rode a mechanical bull before and after at the country, it was a country music club. If you go to a club where they're like doing the Cardi B thing and all that, they don't don't have a mechanical bull. But, um, and this was back in my military days, basic training, uh, they woke us up uh, it was in Fort McCullen, Alabama. They woke us up every morning at 4 a.m. with the song, The Devil Went Down to Georgia. You guys know that song? Yeah. I know all the words and have for like decades because every morning, 4 a.m., that's how they woke us up. But then after basic training, I spent about two years in satellite training in Georgia where, yes, I did the line dancing thing. Um, I did uh, cowboy hats to church and to the club. Uh, also did the mechanical bull before and after. Um, Obviously, it wasn't just the culture. There was also a girl involved. But I drew the line when she was like, it's about time for you to get some boots. And I was like, how much? She's like, about 100, 150. I was like, I'm out. <laughs> not not going to spend that much money on a pair of boots, but people spend that and more. But again, culture, right? There's a culture. There's lots of things in the culture, things that are accepted. They transcend gender, denomination. Doesn't matter if you're black, white, Asian, Hispanic, if you're involved in a culture. These are the things you do. Everyone understands that. It's okay. Make sense? Same is true in the church. There's a culture that should exist within the church. And Timothy, um, who's the recipient of this letter from Paul, Timothy asks a lot of questions to Paul, and Paul just kind of responds to him with a lot of things that, hey, here's some do's, here's some don't do's, but here are some things that should be present in the church culture. And he says, he's asking him to, to send this letter around so it's not just hey, for the church you're at. This is, this is the church in general. Uh, and one of the first things that he talks about and he centers everything around is the teaching in the church. Now, if you weren't here a couple of weeks ago, I put up a, a, a quote uh, from a guy named Charles Finney who in 1873, he had this uh, famous quote where he said a lot of the ills in the community and in the world are the f- responsibility and the fault of the pulpit because the pulpit wasn't doing and preaching what it should Therefore, there was a, 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 a kind of falling away of the conscience of people, government not being responsibility, people mistreating one another, and he blamed the pulpit. And I wholeheartedly agree. So what Paul does 
and this is way before 1873, is he writes this letter to Timothy, and I'm going to just summarize some of the stuff we talked about already. He says, first and foremost, a pulp accretes a culture because there should be solid biblical teaching. Uh, some versions will say no false doctrine or no false teaching, and some versions will say no other doctrine, which is what the actual Greek says, no other doctrine than that of what Jesus Christ came to proclaim. That's the only doctrine that should be taught in the church. And the biblical teaching that permeates from the pulpit goes out to the people and hopefully out into the community. But then he also says that we should be praying for those in authority, right? Because there was a Roman uh, rule of law that said you can worship as many gods as you want or as few as you want, but when you do, you need to pray for the emperor. So Timothy is like, hey, should we be praying for the emperor? Paul said, yeah, pray for the emperor and the kings and everyone in authority. Pray for them all. And he goes on and talks about how they all need Jesus and God wants all men to be saved, regardless of their politi political party, their denomination, uh, even if they're a tyrant or if they're the best ruler to ever live, God wants them all to be saved. Bishop, which is typically how it's translated, uh, it's the Greek word episcopo. It's where the Episcopal Church gets their structure from. Uh, but the word literally means an overseer, not just an overseer or a bishop, but someone who is overseeing and instructing and leading people. Not so much a task-oriented position, but more a people-oriented position. Uh, and in the complete Jewish Bible, I'm going to put that translation up here. This is how they translate it. And the complete Jewish Bible, same text, but viewed in its Greek translation from a Jewish perspective says, here's a statement you can trust. Anyone aspiring to be a congregational leader is seeking worthwhile work. It's not just a bishop or an overseer, but someone who leads people in their task. Uh, then he jumps down to verse 8, and in verse 8, he talks about um, a deacon. He says, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect. And that word deacon is the word diaconus, which it, we typically think, because it's described in Acts, typically think of as, a, as someone who is only serving in a specific role, but that's not what it is. It also applies to people who are accomplishing the task that someone else said they need to, do, need to do. So here, we typically call them team leaders, people who will lead a team and accomplish a task. But here's the thing. In both of those cases, uh, he lists throughout verse 1 to 7 requirements for bishop and from verse 8 on requirements for um, deacons, and I just listed them all together here, summarizing all of that. So really quick, it says a bishop or leader should be above, above reproach. And then he says a bishop or leader, bishop should be the uh, overseer, should be respectable, and the deacon also should be respected. He even says they should be well known and not just inside the church, but outside the church. People should have nothing bad to say about them. Uh, he said they both should be of one wife. And again, if we're going to hyper literally take the text, because the people that says, you know, I don't permit a woman to teach, that's what it says, where it says husband of one wife, that means if you don't have a wife, you can't preach either. But what the Holy Spirit says is they're going to abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. The literal Greek there is follow the doctrine of devils. And although that might sound a little weird, it's any doctrine, as John said, that proclaims that Jesus is not God in the flesh, or any doctrine that takes you away from God, or any doctrine that removes you from the things of God, right? He says, those teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. Now, the forbidding the people to marry, and, and I'm not trying to, you know, cast shade on the Catholic Church, but the whole biblical concept of the priest not being married, not in the Bible. And I can't make the case for this, but a lot of other smarter people than me can and have, that this thing that Paul is talking about, it's called asceticism. I may be mispronouncing it. It's the belief that, hey, if you want to truly follow God spiritually, then you'll let go of all worldly relationships, including a spouse, anything that's going to take you away, romantic relationships. Which, you know, God says, hey, build the church on relationships, so that doesn't make sense. Uh, but uh, that, that and the Jewish concept of what foods you can eat and you can't eat, and he says... Uh, Everything God created is good, nothing to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the word of God in prayer. He said if you point these things out, point out the fact that none of these things are from God, right, 
then you'll be a good minister of Christ Jesus. And the role of a minister of Christ Jesus, that's the role of, of, of what a pastor does. Here's, thus saith the Lord, these things are good. These things God wants for you. These things God has for your life. This is great. This is awesome. Thank you, Jesus. But here are the things that God says maybe we should stay away from. Or maybe we should not do in large amount, like not giving them much wine, no drunkenness, those type of things. He says, um, verse 7, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself up to be godly. And he's using that word train because in those times, if you think of the Roman athletes, they spend a lot of time and money. Today's time, you think of today's athletes, a lot of time and money devoting themselves to training. And he says the same type of energy should be used to us training ourselves. Jump over to uh, verse 11, and he says command, and again, I said throughout this, he says over and over command, eight times he uses that word command, and also teach, because the pulpit drives the culture, teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but again, as a pastor, as a teacher, set an example for the believers in speech, the way that pastors talk, in life, the way that we live our lives, in love, the way that we interact with other people, in faith and in purity, the way that we interact with God. If we're pastors and we're following this, then we should be setting an example of how we live it out in the way that we talk, which I'm going to say that includes the things that we post online, the way that we live our lives in public, the way that we love one another and interact with people in our communities, and in faith and purity in our relationship with God. He says, until I come, devote yourself to public reading of scripture, which is kind of like what we're doing now, to preaching, which is proclaiming the gospel, and teaching, which is explaining, here's why God says this, or here's why this is relevant to your life. Right? So he, he goes through all of that, and then I'm going to jump over to chapter 5. Just bear with me. He starts talking about the culture again for women, specifically for widows, uh, and here's what he says, culture for women, men, treat older women as your mothers. If you're a guy and there's a woman and she is older than you, then you are to treat her like your mother, which means love, respect, and honor. That's simple. If you're a guy and there's a woman who is your age or younger, then you're to treat her like a sister, which means you take care of, you provide for, and you help out. And this is the culture that the church was supposed to take to the world so that every person treated women the way that God wanted women treated. But then he also says that for women, there's a culture, and sometimes, I'm, I don't want anyone, to, you know, don't get mad at me, but sometimes women can be judgmental of one another. They can look at one another in different ways. So he says, hey, women, you're supposed to help and mentor other women. You're supposed to provide for and support one another. You're supposed to be there for one another. So jump over to chapter 5, uh, verse 14. He says this, so I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, to give the enemy no opportunity for slander, which some have already done. And he's talking specifically because there were young women who either through war or whatever would lose their husbands. And then they would say, well, I'm faithful to my husband. I'm a God-fearing woman. But then are the kids out of the Yeah, okay. So then sensual urges would come up. So they would go down to the local house of ill repute, yeah, get their urges met and then come back and be in church on Sunday. I'm still faithful to my dead husband. God, praise the Lord, blah, blah, blah. And then Paul was saying, this is ridiculous. Why are you doing that? Go ahead. Meet someone else. Get married. I mean, God wants people to, you know, fulfill their sexual desires the right way, not Netflix and chill way. But then he goes on and he says, verse 16, if any woman, not just a widow, if any woman is a believer, she has widows in her family, she's supposed to help them out, not let the church or some other organization. And he puts a, a, a kind of like a status on women that was typically only put on men because it was the man's responsibility to take care of the household, including, uh, you know, if the father died, the mother and all the family members. He's saying, women, you have that capability to be there for one another, to encourage one another, and to take care of one another. Then he starts talking about the elders, the presbyteros, which is kind of how the Presbyterian church is defined by a council of elders. He says, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor. And our elders, you guys don't see a lot of the work that they do uh, behind the scenes, either maintenance-wise, or and this is why I ask you to pray for us as we go forward figuring out budget stuff. He says that they're worthy of double honor. And he says, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. 
And then he talks about them being worth uh, their wages. And, and here's the thing, again, I know a lot of people say, you know, church is all about money because all the pastors want is money. Their whole movement's about it. And um, obviously we're not about that here because one of the first things that I gave up was and started chipping away at because uh, it makes logical sense. I spent a lot of years in the business world, and it makes logical sense. Uh, when church finances or any finances get low, you don't cut all the little things. You cut the big thing. And usually the guy at the head is getting the most money. So that was the salary that we did away with first. Uh, I said, hey, let's, don't, let's not worry about team leaders or the custodians or anything else. Let's take away my salary so we can focus on the things that we need to focus on, supporting the missionaries, uh, doing outreach, getting out and doing things for the community, right? But definitely, uh, I don't have a problem with, and I know some people do, pastors that are making all kind of money. If you're leading a church uh, of like 21,000 people, I don't see how you can do that making $400 a month, right? And you're managing more volunteer leaders than most companies have employees. And if you're managing volunteers, it's hard because you can't say your salary is on the line. You've just got to motivate them and inspire them to come help do the work. Verse 21, he says, I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus, um, a God and Christ Jesus and elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. Then he goes on and he talks about saves, slaves, and employees. And I'm going to bypass that because in a couple of weeks, we're going to come back in the next series where we're going to spend some time just talking about the difference in the slaves, the, the, what that word brings to mind today versus what it was back then. So uh, I'm going to ask you to jump over to verse 11 of chapter 6. He says, but you, man of God, flee from all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness, fight the good fight of the faith, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. Verse 13, in the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, again, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he does spend some time, and I think this is worth spending some time on, um, talking about money. Because in verse 17, he says, and this is how he's ending his letter, because in Ephesus, there were a lot of wealthy people, there were a lot of people who made a lot of money off of the entertainment-type industry that was there. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth. And a lot of people look at this and say, this doesn't apply to us today. And I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, I directed you guys to a website. I'm going to direct you there again. Uh, there's a website called globalrichlist.com. If you go to that website and put in your income or your wealth, it will compare you to the rest of the world, not the U.S., because that's where we tend to think Western culture, but in the entire world. And it is updated. I think it probably is not totally reflective uh, because of everything going on in v Venezuela and, and how their economy is, is, has collapsed. Uh, but I took, for example, and I put in $30,000 a year, annual income. The, uh, the median for the United States is just under 60000 like 59000 and change. The average income in Pittsburgh, I think it said it was like 79000 For Jefferson Hills, it either said seventy six or 77000 So I took the average income for the United States, just under 60000 cut it in half to 30000 so if you're in the United States and you're making $30,000 a year, it's going to have a different impact depending on where in the U.S. you live. Like if you live where Christy and I used to live in Ashburn, Virginia, you're going to need at least three roommates just to get an apartment that's like the size of the nursery because not a lot of money. Sorry, that is my phone going off. My apologies. Um, but if you make $30,000 a year and you put that in, you're still wealthier the 98% of the rest of the world. You're within the top one and a quarter percent of the world's wealthy. Now, granted, you're no Elon Musk, right? It's not like you own Amazon. You're not the world's first trillionaire, like Jeff Bezos. But compared to the rest of the entire world, other billions of people on the planet, you're sitting pretty darn good. And if you don't do income, if you just look at what you own, you have a house that's worth $25,000 in equity. 
and you got about $5,000 in possessions of stuff, like $1,000 of investments or just $1,000 in your bank, you're still in the top 20% of the world's wealthiest people. So this definitely speaks to us. And to us, this is what he says to command those people who are rich in this present world, which would be all of us, not to put their hope in wealth, which is uncertain, but to put our hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He says, command them to do good with the money that they have. He says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and to be willing to share. And then he ends it by saying in verse 20, Timothy, guard and protect what has been entrusted to you. And what's been entrusted to him is one, the truth of God's word, and two, the people that he's supposed to share it with. So as the band comes up, let me close with a couple of verses really quick. Because this is important because he says, hey, you're supposed to set an example. The pulpit is what drives the culture of the church. And he says, not only are you supposed to set an example just in how you preach and teach for Christ followers and believers, but in the way that you conduct yourself, in the way that you love other people, and in your faith and your purity to God. And then he says, hey, take that, and you're supposed to protect it. You're supposed to guard it. You're not turn away to all these other teachings, and there's nothing wrong with teaching on a Sunday morning about something that makes you feel good and makes you walk away knowing that God loves you and he dies for you, and you're like, yeah, that was very encouraging. But we're all supposed to do that based on teaching God's word. And the reason why he says that we're not supposed to teach any other doctrine or no false doctrine or nothing that takes away what he calls the doctrines of devil is because before, and we read this in Acts, and we're going to close with this verse, is because as he says in Acts, there is only one name, the name of Jesus Christ, given unto mankind by which they can be saved. If you can imagine someone who is drowning, and instead of throwing them a life raft, you pull up a nice, beautiful car. That can't help them. Imagine if someone, a plane's going down, and, and, and pray for it, the families, all those people, of the plane that went down, and all the people whose travel schedules are being thrown around because of those planes. But uh, imagine a plane's going down, and instead of handing out parachutes, they gave you like, hey, here's free movie tickets. Enjoy. Yeah, it's of value, and at another time it make, might make them feel good, but it's not what's going to save them. And as Paul, or excuse me, as Peter makes pretty clear here, there's salvation in no one else other than the name of Jesus Christ. And our teaching and our lifestyle needs to reflect that. So again, my apologies. I know we went long this week. We went long last week. We typically don't go that long, uh, but I felt like we needed to spend some time on talking about what Paul thought was important, understanding the culture that's supposed to exist inside the church. I'm going to ask you guys to stand, and we're going to close out with a time of prayer. God, we thank you so much, again, for allowing us to gather. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you looked at us and saw our need for a Savior. We thank you that you provided a Savior. And we thank you for the privilege that we have to go out and proclaim the name of that Savior to those within our circles of influence. And I pray that just as Paul told to Timothy, and as I am saying now, that we would protect and guard the truths in your word and clearly share them so that they are understood, so that people might experience salvation, that they might be able to look for and seek a God of love. I personally pray for myself and for every pastor in this community that we would, as your word says, that we would set a pattern in our lives of how we preach, of how we love the people in our community and interact with them, and of our faith and trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for a minute. And I, I truly hope that as we're praying right now that we realize that there is no other name 
through which people can be saved. And God, I pray that you impress it upon our hearts to stay faithful and true to your word. Not just when we gather here on Sunday mornings, but that culture of living out your words outside of these four walls. The way that we interact with people, the way that we love people, the way that we talk to people, the way that we treat people. God, I pray that we truly realize that it is through your word that hope can be restored to our homes, to our schools, to the cities, to the nations through the name of Jesus Christ that people can have hope restored in relationships, people can have hope restored in overcoming addictions, that people can have hope restored in just bondage to slavery of sin being broken through the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you have not made that profession of faith, then you don't need to raise your hand, you don't need to come forward. All you need to believe is that God is able through what Jesus did on the cross to restore your relationship with him just by you putting your hope and your faith in the finished work of the name of Jesus. By believing that, yes, we were separated from God for our sins, but that he sent his son to die for our sins so that we might spend an eternity with him set apart from sin. And that same truth that we just talked about here is available for not just those here, but for everyone outside of these four walls. And we get the privilege of sharing that with the people in our circle of influence. God, we pray that you would bless us as we go. We pray that we would just, again, walk out of here inspired by your word to live out your truth. And to be a, just a living testimony of your goodness and grace to the people in our circles of influence. And we thank you and praise you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And everyone said amen. 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 amen.